hearers and doers of the Word of God. The Word of God which brings us forth, which gives us new life, is God's own beloved children. And following up a little bit with our kids' message, we want to talk today about how important and how valuable God's Word is for us and to us in our lives as we journey through this world. And I want you to allow me to share with you this morning our sermon text, which is found on page 6 of our bulletin, James chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And please rise as we hear these words in Jesus' name. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, be with us this morning. Send your helper, the Holy Spirit, send him into our hearts so that your word of truth might be opened unto us that we might see the great treasure that you have given to us and that you share with us through your word. Help us to always revere it and to keep it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, it is so frightening when you are lost. When you don't know where or to whom you can turn to for help, it's downright terrifying when you have those times where you realize that you are all alone. I think I've told you the story before, but I'll do it again. As a little boy, my mom took me to the local county fair, and I managed as a four or five year old little boy to wander off, to get lost. I remember deciding that whether mom liked it or not, I was going to go back and look at those model trains. They were so cool. And so I found my way over to the building. I spent 10, 15 minutes watching the trains run around on their tracks. I got a real kick out of it until I looked up and I realized that there was no one around me that I knew. I realized that I was in an unfamiliar place, and there were all these unfamiliar faces all around me. And that was really terrifying as a five-year-old. It was rather traumatizing. I didn't know where I could go to. I didn't know where I could turn for help. I had that terrible, unforgettable feeling of loneliness. Lonely. In spite of the fact that there were all these people around me, I didn't know them. I didn't know if I could trust any of them. Thankfully, some of the workers, some of the officials there at the fair, they saw me, and they took me to the lost and found tent, where my mom, who was also rather distraught, she found me. And boy, was it nice to see a familiar face, to see a loving face once again. To realize that the person that I needed and that person that I counted on was still there for me. All oh, the joy, the happiness of realizing that. What a relief it was to know that I wasn't all alone or helpless. Now, dear friends, I know that there are a lot of people walking around in this world right now who are feeling spiritually alone, spiritually helpless. There are all sorts of people who don't know who or where they can turn to for any spiritual help. 
Where should they go? To whom should they turn? As Jesus was preparing himself and also his disciples for the time when he would no longer be physically, bodily present with them, when he was preparing them for his arrest and for his death, and then also preparing them for the time when he would ascend into heaven and, and no longer be visibly present with them, as he was preparing him for these times, he was giving his disciples comfort by telling them, as we heard a few moments ago in our gospel lesson, that he wasn't going to leave them alone or helpless, but that he was going to be with them. In fact, he promised them that he would send them a very special helper, the Spirit of Truth, he said, the Holy Spirit, who would guide them and lead them as Christ Jesus did. By the working of the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells them that the truths of God and of God's Word would be opened to them. It would be revealed and understood by them. Likewise, it would be proclaimed by them as well. These teachings of Jesus would be made clear to his followers by that work of the Spirit. What Jesus was doing in our gospel lesson with his apostles and really with, with all of his future disciples, you and I included, was preparing us so that we would know where we can turn to here in this world when we face trying or difficult times. Jesus doesn't want anyone to feel as if they're all alone or helpless here in this world. He doesn't want anyone to feel as if they're lost or wandering around without any spiritual help or guidance. No. Jesus has promised his followers a helper. We have a helper sent to us from God, the Holy Spirit, whose job it is to bring Jesus into our hearts. And when Jesus enters into our hearts by that working of the Holy Spirit, so come all the blessings and benefits that members of Christ's kingdom are entitled to. Even here in this world, isn't that a marvelous thing to consider? Doesn't that sound great? Yes, we want those benefits and blessings that the members of Christ's kingdom are entitled to. We want them. So where do we find the Holy Spirit? Where do we get this divine help? Should we do as some have done and they sit around, they meditate until they feel enlightened and, and moved, inwardly moved? Should we go out and help the poor, do good works, until we feel as if we've worked enough bad juju out of us so that the Spirit might come and enter into us? No. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's not how faith works. That's not how God has decided to share His comfort or His help or His guidance with us. Instead, God has established and he has given to his church on earth certain tools, certain objects that are connected to him by his own promise. And to these tools, we can turn so that we can find and have that comfort and help and guidance that God wants us to have as we journey through the struggles and turmoils of this world. These tools are what we know as the means of grace. The tools by which God's grace, His undeserved love, is handed and given over to us. And really what the means of grace, what these tools of the Holy Spirit are all about, is God's Word. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, really, it's just water. It would be just bread and wine if God's word were not connected to them. It is his word that's connected to the water and baptism that gives it the power to wash away sins, to create, sustain, and strengthen faith in our hearts. It is his word that is connected to the bread and to the wine 
which we partake in for the forgiveness and remission of all of our sins. Likewise, it's His Word that we find in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. As we mentioned, the sole purpose of them is to point us to the Word that was made flesh, to our Savior Jesus, pointing us to His perfect life, to sacrificial death, to His resurrection from the dead, showing us that because of these things, He is our Savior from sin. Dear friends, there's no need for anyone to be wandering around hopelessly, lonely, or in desperation. Jesus has prepared his followers for difficult times by promising to help us, by sending us the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who is going to work through these means of grace, who is going to work through God's Word to comfort us and to give us hope and guidance. And that's really the main point that we see in our text as before us from James. Such a beautiful verse that James writes, Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth. What a beautiful, comforting verse. Of His own will He brought us forth by His word of truth. It first of all emphasizes that it's all God's doing. It wasn't by our abilities or by our own work. Fact is, our abilities are all lacking. Our own work could never be enough. And we are unreliable people. We wouldn't want to rely upon ourselves to provide comfort or to guide ourselves through this world. No, instead it's God's will. It's God's work that provides for us any comfort, help, or direction. It's God's doing. It is in His work that we have hope. As our text said in the verses previous, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow that's due to change. It is reliable. We can count on God. We can be certain in these gifts and in this guidance and in this comfort and hope that He wants to give us. Because that's the very nature of our God. <clears throat> that beautiful verse also emphasizes that God gives us His comfort and hope. He provides us with His grace through the word of truth. We are brought forth, we are born by the word of truth, it said. We have God's comfort, we have his hope, we have his grace. It's brought to us, it's even implanted into us by his word. The word that's given in the holy, errorless, perfect scriptures in the Bible. The word that's connected to water and baptism. The word that's connected to the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. As Jesus in the gospel lesson was preparing his followers to know that they will have divine help as they face the troubles and difficulties of this world. So too does Jesus want you to know that you have divine help freely offered to you through his word. By giving to us that precious heirloom of the scriptures. By giving us these precious gifts of baptism and of the Lord's Supper, Jesus has done exactly what that verse in the 23rd Psalm said he would do. Prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Jesus has prepared a feast for us to come and to enjoy. In spite of the fact that danger lurks all around us here in this world. Jesus prepares us, and he invites us as his followers to come and to receive this feast of his word. To receive this feast which the Holy Spirit will then take and use in our hearts to create and to strengthen faith. And so that we might be able to reap these kinds of benefits. And that we might be able to 
to enjoy this feast, James gives us some advice in our text. He gives us some encouragement in that second part of our text. He says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, James writes. In explaining this section, I heard another pastor once ask, what's the best way to ruin your appetite for Thanksgiving dinner? I don't know, try spending the entire morning filling up on snacks and appetizers and junk food. Eat candy until you're sick to your stomach. Drink eggnog until it's coming out your ears. Then when the feast is on the table and you're invited to come and sit down, guess what? You're going to be full. You've eaten all this other junk. You're not going to have any room inside of you for the real feast because you filled up on all that other stuff. Likewise, dear friends, we have the tendency as sinful people to fill our hearts and souls with worthless junk, like impatience, like anger, like filth or wickedness, these things that James is talking about. And when such things have filled your heart, how can, then, how can you then enjoy the true feast of God's Word? That's why James encourages us to kick these other things out of our hearts, clean out the junk, so that we might digest and absorb the true feast of God's word. To receive it with meekness. Humbly let God's word into your hearts, into your life. Humbly let it guide and direct you as you're journeying through this world. Let it provide you with the comfort and hope that belongs to you as a Christian. Because that word, as James says, is able to save our souls. That's a happy thing, dear friends. Today, as I mentioned before, is Cantate Sunday. Cantate, meaning sing out. Sing out to the Lord a new song. And we can do just that. We can be happy and we can rejoice. For we have been given this great treasure, this great feast of God's word. Our Old Testament lesson a few moments ago from Isaiah talked about drawing from the wells of salvation. Well, that's what we do when we open up God's word and when we feast upon it. With it, we can never be alone. With it, we can't be hopeless. We can't be lost. Instead, through God's word, we receive God's comfort. We have a certain hope. In our salvation, we have God's grace, we have His guidance here in this world. As the old Lutheran preacher from Pennsylvania, Reverend Emmanuel Cronenwet, he was a prolific hymn writer, he wrote in hymn verse, Abiding, steadfast, firm, and sure, the teachings of God's Word endure. And so blessed is he who trusts this steadfast word, for his anchor holds in Christ the Lord. May we always hold in that word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together now in singing our offertory on page six of our book.